You're listening to Road to Resilience. I'm John Earl. Last episode, I said we'd be doing another piece on immigration, and we are, but it's not quite ready yet, so we're going to switch things up. Today on the show, I'm speaking with a woman who has been through the ringer and emerged even stronger. I'm talking about comedy writer, director, and producer Jeannie Gaffigan. Jeannie and her husband, comedian Jim Gaffigan, were the brains behind the Jim Gaffigan Show, and their work on Jim's comedy specials have earned them four Grammy nominations. And in addition to their busy professional life, they're the parents of five kids. In 2017, Jeannie's life was turned upside down when she was diagnosed with a pear-sized brain tumor. In her new memoir, When Life Gives You Pears, she writes about her journey from sickness to health and the role that humor, faith, and family played in her recovery. Jeannie recently had surgery on her vocal cords, so her voice is a little scratchy. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. So I think even by the standards of New York, you are an extraordinarily busy person. And I know you you mentioned in the book that you uh, are the oldest of nine kids. Yes. Is that, would you say, where this comes from, this kind of um, caretaking, frenetic, like, stay busy? If you don't have a project, make a project. I mean, I think... Um that probably in that environment probably did have something to do with it because um, my mom was pregnant my whole life, pretty much my whole childhood life. It, she was in a state of um, needing help. So I think that I was kind of raised into that um, model. But I, I've gotten myself in a position where, yes, I have five kids. Yes, you know, we're very blessed to have like this really intense, productive career. And Jim is brings a lot of work in and it just keeps appearing and piling up mm. and obviously with our career you have to like strike while the iron's hot because you never know when people are gonna be like yeah they're not funny anymore yeah, it's over it's over <laughs> so we have to just keep working on that and then i have this like really strange medical condition that's not related to any of uh my um brain tumor or anything else but it's like this inability for my mouth to say the word no when people ask me to do things so i'll run to someone at school and um they will say you know the the lost and found here is just such a huge problem there's no no one running it and i'm like okay let me look into that and then like 25 phone calls later i realize oh wait i'm now in charge of like fixing the lost and found system so I, it's this constant process I have of like trying to set boundaries with myself. Mm. And then suddenly um, I got this amazing brain tumor that just like <laughs> put pair, me out of tumor gate. Tumor gate. Let's started. talk about tumor gate. Yeah. It starts with uh, the hearing loss, right? That's right. Now, yeah. um, that's what really prompted the MRI. Right. But in retrospect, after speaking to Dr. Betterson about um, symptoms and things like that, mm-hmm. Like, tumor gate started a long time ago, and it may have been insidiously growing for, like, 10 years. 10 years. Because I just compartmentalized all my symptoms because I was so busy. Right. So I just made them all, like, their own separate things. So I separately, they seemed like little mild annoyances. So it was the hearing that was balanced, too, right? There was it, was, it was hearing. It was balance. It was headaches. Mm. It was, um, you know, all the things when viewed together were, like— like you brain idiot brain genie, brain. right? <laughs> but there was no reason for me to connect them until I was diagnosed, and then it was like, "Do you have this? Do you have that?" Yes, yes, yes. Right, and then and, you end up at Mount Sinai and with Dr. Betterson and this kind of like a made you end up with the top guy. I ended up with the top guy, unbelievably, unbelievably. Like, and it wasn't, you know, I just remember at a certain point. I think I in my recovery. I was posting on Instagram, and I think somebody made a comment like, well, it's easy for you know celebrities to get medical care when other people can't, or made a comment like, I must have kind of been like, do you know who I am? Honestly, there was no one even knew my name. Like, it was literally like the Red Sea was in the way, and it parted, and I walked right into Dr. Betterson's office. So... um I really feel like um, there was definitely miracle stuff happening. And I'm not ashamed to say in the book. I'm not afraid of like people giving, oh, wait, you lost me at faith. Sorry. Yeah. Don't, not interested. I'm an atheist. Yeah. Tell us about your faith and then the role that your faith played in this journey. 
Okay, well, um, you know, I've never really been a, you know, a Bible thumper in terms of like proselytizing or being like it's my way or the highway. Um, because I I really feel like what I believe is that, um, you know, it's more of a like you worry about how your your own life is going. So my lens is that I grew up Catholic. And um, even though I wasn't always the best Catholic, I still like God and like, you know, the Virgin Mary and these people were characters in my life. Like they were real to me. They are real. And so I think that when I was faced with this situation, like I was faced with a lot of other really crappy situations in my life, instead of being like, why God, why? If you were real, you wouldn't have done this to me. I was just like, oh, I get it. Um, I can't handle this. And I need a higher power to help me get through this. And so what my faith is, is kind of this like belief in that this isn't it. There's something beyond this. And many times in our life, we're going to have to like, you know, can't hide from pain, can't hide from tragedy. People can go for, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years without having any tragedy, I'm sure. But when it comes, and it will come, there's a few things that I would suggest. One is figure out what your spirituality is. Mm -hmm. What can you hang on to that makes it not so dark? Because when I didn't have that, it was really dark. When I let go of believing in something bigger out of this, it got really dark for me. I went to a really dark place and I was just miserable. And I was like, I will never, ever get out of this hospital. And I'll never get, I'll never be able to do this again. I'll never be able to see my kids again. I would go to that place, which was really hard. But then I would remember, oh, wait, there's something more. There's some reason this is happening. There's a bigger picture here. And I would, so I would say, okay, let me look around at my surroundings. What am I supposed to be learning here? Even if I never get out of this room. What did you conclude? What did you come to? It's to look at these small moments that we just blow off in our lives. And just every day, even if you have to tie a string around your finger, every day be like, okay, I'm going to just, you know, right now I'm looking at your iced coffee here, right? When I take a sip of this iced coffee and swallow it, I'm going to think to myself, how glorious is that feeling of swallowing that water going down your throat? Because when I was in a situation where I could not swallow a drop of water. Yeah, so I want to set the scene a little bit. So you had yeah. this, you have the surgery, and and when you're talking about um, the dark moments and and faith, um, you're in the hospital bed for two weeks. For two weeks, yeah. Um, but there's it seemed a period of time, like several months, right? And but for several months, you uh, you can't eat, take, or, eat drink. Yeah. or drink. Yeah, um, but I was moved home at some point. But I was still right. in a bed with. Right, the but I just want I just want to paint a picture so that people understand yeah. they're listening. Like, sorry about that. I forgot. Where, that. Yeah, where you're at um, when you're having these thoughts about so appreciating a cup really of coffee. So I had really successful surgery. Right. It was like an emergency brain surgery, which is like so funny to me. I mean, it's funny. How long was the operation? <sighs> It's like an eight-hour, ten, something. It was, I think the actual surgery was nine hours, but it took 12 hours, the whole yeah. thing. And um, my husband's really funny because he did this bit about how they were walking him through what was going to happen. And um, Dr. Bettison said that he's going to do this first, and then he's going to stop for lunch, and then he's going to go back. And Jim's like, why would he tell me he was stopping for lunch? <laughs> Is he afraid I'm going to run into him in the cafeteria and be like, what are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be in the OR with my wife? Um, but yes, okay, so anyway, I had a very successful surgery. And um, then because um, where the tumor was on my cranial nerves, at some point in the, I think the day after the surgery, I aspirated my own saliva because I had, you know, my uh, swallow function was all messed up. Mm -hmm. And I got double lung strep pneumonia, and I was in very... In Jeopardy. And so I got intubated and, you know, there was a lot of like crazy things happening and it was a nothing by mouth uh, situation. So I couldn't even swallow a drop of water. And um, I think that that more than anything else 
um, was the most difficult for me. And I think there was something about being in that state that awoke something more deeper spiritually in me because it was like, uh, it was probably like the worst feeling. Not and I'm not a big, drink. I'm not even a big eater or drinker. Like I'm not even the one in my family who's <laughs> known for like being a pig. Famous for it. But I never even thought how lucky I was before to be able to do it. And there are people that, you know, live with a with a food tube. They never are able to swallow and have that feeling. And there's something about making these little realizations about what you should be grateful for that awake a whole new part of your brain. And that's why I told you to drink the coffee and really feel it going down your throat. I want to talk about humor. Because humor is such a big part of this book and your life. Uh, of course, you know, you're a comedy writer. Jim, um, your brother, too, publishes, Paul publishes yeah, Paul cartoons in The New Yorker. Yeah. Um, so you were surrounded by this amazing, funny community, and there are great scenes in the book. Um, I was wondering if any of them... Actually, I guess the one I want to talk about is after you're, you're home and, you know, you have to get pegged. Yeah. Can you talk about what pegging is and what Jim turned it into? Yes. Okay, so I got a, um, a peg tube, which was my, like what I would call eating. It was my feeding tube. And there are these, like, bags of mixed, like, organic food, like baby food, that you can— pour into this cup with some water and shake it up and take it in a syringe and put it in your peg tube like a meal. So I was kind of like, oh, great. This is my, because also the name of the food sounds really good. It's like, you know, couscous chicken and spinach. And you're like, oh, delicious. But you never get to taste taste it it. because it's just a formula. So I was kind of like down in the dumps because it seemed like I should be able to like taste something, but I couldn't. And so Jim decided that he was going to make this kind of fun. Uh, All of a sudden, I came in. He was like, are you ready to be pegged? Which I guess is some kind of dirty, uh, you know, term. And I was like, I don't think so. And I went into the kitchen. He had like like candles lit. And he just played this character who was like, you know, very romantically like pegging food into like a hose that ran right into my stomach. And he made this whole, like, talk show, like, cooking show about it where he would invite guests on. Like, people would come over, and he's like, oh, it's time for Jeannie's pegging. Would you like to peg my wife? (laughs) And then he would do this thing where he, like, criticized the way that they were pegging. It was very funny. And he made this really kind of, like, awkward, gross, horrible thing really great and funny. And so that helped me get through it. Right. And and the bigger picture to me seemed also that as you as your abilities to be the caretaker were diminished, you were able to see other people grow, right? You saw Jim grow in a new way. You saw your kids grow in a new way. Can you talk about that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Um, I think that um, a lot of people who are, um, you know, can relate to this. I don't want to just say it's for mothers or, you know, type A crazy people like me. But the way that I am, I like to kind of executive produce everything. So in the past, it would be like, okay, I could ask, fight with my child about picking up their Legos for 20 minutes and then have them like do a really like half-assed job of it and put them in the wrong like buckets and fix them later. Um, Or I could just do it myself. And it got to the point where I was like, applying that to like everything i was like oh don't worry i'll do it i'll do it i'll do it and so i was kind of like doing everything for my kids and to a certain point jim and a certain point my employees and when i was not able to do anything i saw people figuring stuff out for themselves and i realized that i was stifling their growth by doing everything for them and then when i wasn't they really like parts of my husband came out where he was he found his caregiving ability. It wasn't as you know uh, what what mine is, but it it's not going to go away now. It blossomed, so these things that blossom through this illness like are now these kind of permanent things that have just made all of our lives better. 
That's so lovely. Kind of to that to that point about where where you are now and how you. Um, I guess my question is, when you you go through this experience and you learn these lessons and have these observations, and I imagine it's tough to then you know continue to practice them. Like it takes practice. It takes um, intentionality. Yes. So what does the practice look like? How do you integrate the lessons? Well, I mean, I think everyone has to to tailor it to their own life. But for me, um, I need reminders. So at the last chapter of my book, I have a meaningful to-do list that I think I'm going to get made into a coaster and just give it away to people. You know, it's literally like, take a moment and show gratitude for something today. Randomly be kind to someone today. Tell someone you love them today. Like make a to-do list that has nothing to do with your busyness. Mm. But you need that. Like for me, I need a string around my finger or a list. Do you literally have one? Do you have something on your phone? Yeah, yeah. yeah, desktop. But if you get too busy, you just it becomes like white noise again. So you have to constantly reset these boundaries with yourself. You know, I'm I, I literally like am thinking of like designing a projector for you know how people have a projector where their alarm clock goes on their ceiling. So when I wake up in the morning, they see the the projected time. Yeah. Like I need one of those with like a a shifting message every morning. What would it say? Well, it would rotate, but it would be like, um, say I love you to your husband before you say anything else. So, um, you know, thank God that you woke up. You know, simple little things, and after a while you will literally see your life transform. Well, Jeannie, thank you so much for being on the podcast. This was a real pleasure. It was really fun talking to you. Thank you. Jeannie Gaffigan's memoir, When Life Gives You Pears, hits the shelves on October 1st and is available for pre-order now. Road to Resilience is a production of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. It's produced by Katie Ullman, Nikki Hudson, and me, John Earl. Our executive producers are Dory Klesis and Lucia Lee. If you liked what you heard, give us a rating on Apple Podcasts and share the podcast with a friend. We really appreciate it. From all of us here, thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time. If you want to finish what you were saying about... Um... I have no idea what I'm <laughs> I had a brain tumor, for God's sake. <laughs>